This is the College of Complexes, David. Well, yeah, we have uh, assembled on this cold and snowy night. Uh, we few, we precious few, we band of brothers uh, and sisters. And, uh, and here we are, going to discuss the law and drugs. Okay, without any further ado, we will hear from our yeah. speaker on uh, the uh, law enforcement against prohibition. All right. Uh, lieutenant from the Denver Police Department, where I served for 36 years, 30 of them in patrol in uniform, uh, 26 of those as either a supervisor or commander of the street cops. So <clears throat> my background is street, not investigations or anything else, just really street. So let me start off with just some rhetorical questions. We can talk about them later, but just for the beginning of this, some questions. What do you think is responsible for the following? 50 Mexicans killed every day. 4,100 Americans arrested every day. 17,000% profit for sellers. 1.7 billion tax dollars every week. The highest number of complaints against police departments. Corruption in government, prisons, law enforcement, and the military. Yes, sir. The government's responsible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, sir. The uh, <coughs> deal in the drug trade. <clears throat> the illegal drug trade, thank you. That's exactly right. <clears throat> so we are law enforcement against prohibition. We are former and actually current police officers. We made up of, like I said, police officers, uh, prosecutors, Jim Gearock here in, uh, in uh, Chicago, former prosecutor of Cook County one of our board members as am I, and um, corrections workers, judges, all of whom have seen the war on drugs firsthand, and we've seen its results, and frankly, we don't like it. Nice, sir. Now, if you look around at people, you obviously read a lot of things, I've heard you discussing a number of things, so I really know there's every day Drugs are in the news one way or another. You read about more drugs being seized. You read about more drug money being seized. You read about um, new record, quote unquote, drug busts. Seems like after 43 years, they finally quit getting the biggest drug bust ever, but especially marijuana, but they still do. For some strange reasons. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay, I'm going to speak more on this. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and more and more drug wing swap operations are, quote, destroyed, crippled, or ended. And every time the DEA brags about how they destroyed some drug organization, I go, and while you're cleaning up that mess, the other one has already started. And you saved them some work. They didn't have to go to war with them to take over the territory. So, so they do have a, a good purpose there. <clears throat> so, the question is, has the war on drugs worked? I have a picture here on my computer, but I can't show it to you, but it's a picture of a car in the 1930s, one of the old um, mob-style cars that you saw all the time. And uh, on it, it has a women's group that wrote on the side of the car, or had printed on the side of the car, painted. I think it says, stamp out prohibition, save our children, and a couple of other things regarding alcohol prohibition. Back in the 1920s, and this was probably uh, in the early 30s, when alcohol prohibition ended, because it was a devastating policy that made, only made matters worse, not better. Drove it underground, created the mob, the mafia, which was the uh, black market operators of the day. We would submit that today, the reason we call ourselves law enforcement against prohibition is because the drug war is, in our book, the second prohibition in this country. And it has the same, unfortunately, predictable results. Same old still. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit, if you don't mind. 
Speaking of the war on drugs, we would like to ask the question of we uh, that have reduced overdoses. Uh, there was a particular, particularly famous overdose uh, earlier this week, or late last week, of an actor in New York, heroin overdose. And um, they're suspecting, although they haven't found it yet in the, in the, the autopsy of the event, they're suspecting fentanyl was added. The reason they suspect that is because in, the, in uh, Maryland, in one week, they have 26 heroin overdose deaths. Uh, where people were all of a sudden getting fentanyl in their heroin when they bought it out on the street, which is where you buy that stuff nowadays. And a few um, in Virginia also, a few deaths all in the last couple of weeks. Something like a total of about 40 or 50 people have died. And that happens every now and then. The reason it happens is because people that find themselves addicted to heroin have to buy it from people that are selling it on the street, always looking for profit. And every now and then, uh, somebody gets a little clownish and decides, let's spice this up a little bit. And they take a dose of something that their body isn't used to, and they end up dead. One of the aspects of the war on drugs is you're buying it in an underground market. You're not sure what you're getting or what somebody may have decided to add to it. And it can cause you some real problems. Anyway, heroin users now are four times more likely to die of an overdose than in 1969. This recent couple of weeks notwithstanding, that's just a general rule of late. So we maintain that after 43 years of the modern phase of the drug war, where drugs are more available, um, more powerful and much less expensive than ever, it's still going on. It hasn't yeah, stopped. In fact, it's gotten worse. So how prevalent is drug use? Recent government studies, government studies show that the number of people in the U.S. above the age of 12 who have used an illegal drug is nearly 113 million, 37 percent of our population. Fine, remember, honey. People 12 and older. That's an ongoing thing. The uh, government's main law enforcement entity in enforcing this war on drugs is known as the Drug Enforcement Administration. It was, it's the old Bureau of Narcotics, his name was changed by President Nixon when he declared this war on drugs in 1971. Their only job is drug enforcement, they don't do any other kind of police work. And by the way, we have drug enforcement <coughs> agents in 28 countries around the world. 28 countries, including ours. <clears throat> we started out... Um, as that organization officially in 1973 with uh, 2,800 total employees, half special agents, half support staff, with a budget of about $75 million. Today, or as of last year, because that's all the figures we have, they haven't come out for anything else, 9,600 employees, 5,000 special agents in 28 countries, and their budget is almost $3 billion a year. Just part of the expenses of the war on drugs. Um, the DEA likes to list their activity and what they've accomplished every year on their website. <clears throat> they list um, the amount of drugs that are seized. That's how they measure their success and what they've seized. And so we have statistics like we had from uh, last year, actually from 2012. It takes them a while to compile all of this information. So and they, their activity was down a little bit. Um, from 2011. We still had 304,856 kilograms of drug seizures in 2012. 3,898 kilograms of meth, or actually 0.0098% of their seizures. People think that meth is really horrible and is the worst drug out there, and it seems to be the least enforced. Heroin is next. With 930 kilograms, 934 kilograms, even less than meth, that's a 0.00236 percent of their seizures. Cocaine, 0.0923 percent of their seizures. So, what do you think they work on the most? What's illegal drug do they work on the most? Marijuana. Stats? Marijuana. It is 96 and a half percent of their seizures by their own stats. The cost of fighting the drug war, 1970, President Nixon allowed for $100 million to be spent to take care of the drug problem in our country. 
Jeffrey Myron, he's a Harvard Myron, he's a Harvard economist. Pretty well known. He likes to study the war on drugs. He had for a number of years when I first started with Leap uh, when they were about three years old. He was estimating that the uh, war on drugs was costing taxpayers a little over $40 billion a year. Now, he says it's $88 billion a year just for the war on drugs. $88 billion. Like your tax dollars for this effort. Some of the things you might be able to do with that money, in case you're interested, is pay for all of America's uninsured people at a cost of $128 billion, just a little more, than, a little more than half more than that. You could probably give free college education to everyone in the country for $60 billion a year. Free college. And total energy independence for the United States with a shift to renewables, the things we're trying to move forward in the next 10 years would cost about $500 billion. So you know, four or five years of uh, drug war expenditures, and they could pay for that. Huh. <clears throat> Meanwhile, again, stats that are not totally new, the vast solid stats we have coming from the FBI regarding drug enforcement efforts throughout the country, not just DEA. We talked about total drug arrests in the United States. So in 2010, there were 1,700,000 plus drug arrests. Arrest for illegal drugs. Okay? Okay. Of that, 847,863 were for, yes, marijuana. Marijuana trafficking, in other words, the people that sell, was 93,000 of that, 93,600 of that, 847,000. So the other 684,400 some were marijuana possession arrests, possession alone, not sale, just possession. That adds up to 89% of the arrests, drug arrests, were for marijuana possession. Not the other drugs that people seem to be the most worried about. Now for the good part, the money, the real money part, where the drug cartels come in and so forth. This international drug trade, illicit drug trade, actually adds up to every year by a little over 500 billion dollars. That's why they're killing each other for the right to sell drugs on the, on the black market, because they're illegal. Lots of money involved in that. What other parts of the world think about this? Well, we can talk about Great Britain, <clears throat> who after a two-year uh, study, I call it the Royal Society on Everything. The name is the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturing, and Commerce, and Commission of Illegal Drugs, all in one package. Quite a mix. After a two year study, they said we need to end drug prohibition. They say, quote, drug use should be seen in the context of our use of alcohol and tobacco, which is often far more harmful. Alcohol and tobacco. Drugs policy should, like our policy on alcohol and tobacco, seek to regulate use and prevent harm rather than to prevent use altogether. To prevent use altogether. <coughs> They also say the aim of drugs policy should be to reduce harm. In most of Western Europe, this is what they talk about, harm reduction in terms of drug policy. <clears throat> That's the code phrase for that. The United States Conference of Mayors, that's a group of mayors from around the country, it's the mayors of cities with 30,000 population or more, they get together every year, those that want to attend, and they talk about various things, and two or three times in the last few years, they've made a comment about our war on drugs. It starts out after a few other whereas, this and that and the other. One thing they say is an estimated 113 million Americans involved and over have used an illicit drug at least once. They say, whereas the United States has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners incarcerating more than 2.3 million citizens in our prisons and jails. They say the drug war has failed and they call for a new bottom line in the U.S. drug policy. Guess what? Kind of like England. A public health approach that concentrates more fully on reducing the negative consequences, ensuring that our policies do not exacerbate these problems and or create new social problems of their own. Therefore, they say the United States Conference of Mayors urges the President of the United States to re-examine the priorities of federal agencies to prevent the expenditure of resources 
on actions that undermine the duly enacted marijuana laws of states. So we have a lot of people already talking about this. They've been talking about it for several years now. People are beginning to recognize the damage that this 43, now 43 year old policy has caused. And we can say nothing's let up. Drugs are still out there. They're less expensive, they're more potent, they're more damaging. And uh, it stops, creates a lot of violence. So we have one thing that we want to do. We want to end prohibition. And I'll say right up front before you get too excited about that, we're not for drug use. Never used anything in my life, actually, not even marijuana. But it's smoked tobacco for a while. Got over that about 35 years ago. <clears throat> I don't even drink. I got drunk once I was really young and said, that's enough of that. I almost cost you my job. I forgot to go to work that day. So I got people talking to about that and said, okay. So maybe at Christmas I'll have a glass of wine or something, but that's about it. So not that I'm totally pure or anything. I just choose not to use those substances. I just get you in trouble. So we think some of the outcomes of legalization, first of all, we talked about 1.8 million people being arrested every year. That will stop. There'll be somebody who'll try to go around the system and, and do that and they'll get arrested, but it won't be 1.8 million. It'll be long, far from that. We'll save approximately $88 billion a year. Some people say, well, that's going to cause everybody to we're not start using drugs, so it hasn't happened elsewhere. We like to talk particularly about the Netherlands, where they've uh, basically legalized drugs for quite some time now. Temp Rivers in Holland, who have tried marijuana, where it's basically legal, not really for young people, but 10th graders still do it, and still get to it in this country, too. Um, it's about 28% in Holland. Here in the United States, 10th graders, 41% are playing with marijuana. Well, it's strictly illegal. Drug and violence indicators in the U.S. and the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, marijuana use lifetime prevalence is about 16%. They play with it for a while, they get a little older, they get over it. In the U.S., it's still not all that bad, but it's twice the amount. That amount is 33% here in the U.S. Lifetime prevalence of marijuana use. Heroin use. We talk about heroin. We've had all these recent heroin deaths because somebody's been messing with it. And these people are suddenly dying. Heroin use in the Netherlands, lifetime prevalence is 0.3%. Mainly because in Switzerland and a couple other Netherlands countries, they say, if you have a heroin problem or some other kind of problem, just come see us. We'll give you methadone, or if you really need it, heroin, if you're that bad off. We'll give it to you with clean needles so you don't pass disease by sharing needles. We'll give it to you, send you on your way. You'll be good for a few hours or half a day. Come back when you're in the adults, we'll give you another one. Is there a bottle over here? We've had, uh, among other things, these people, drug addicts, are less of an addict. They don't have to go to criminals yeah. to buy their drugs. They don't have to commit crime. To get the money to buy their drugs from the illegal market. By the way, their crime rate has gone down about 60% as a result of this. And people get off heroin. However long it takes, they do it. They stick with it. And other drugs that they have problems with also. Speaking of uh, things, and um, I'm sure you've all read news from time to time about South Chicago since you live here. A little gunplay goes on over there every now and then, a lot of things. And uh, the, uh, you think they're laughing. I'm laughing a little. And uh, I spent 22 years in Northeast Denver, which is Denver's black community, so not quite as much going on there as it is but still, there's a lot of stuff going on. And a lot of that is because that's where a lot of the drug dealing and selling on the street goes. And uh, somebody sees somebody making a lot of money, and they want to take over. And the best way to do it is just knock them off, because they're going to try and get rid of you if you try to interfere, so that's how it works. Homicide rate per 100,000 in the Netherlands, two. Here in the U.S., eight. Incarceration rates in Western European nations per 100,000 population is at or below 100. Here in the U.S., 720. We like to put people in prisons. Not prisons are privatized. That's a whole new part of the ball game now. They're not for profit. Kind of changes the things a little bit. White males in the United States per 100,000 that are arrested or whatever, about 717. Way back in uh, South Africa in 1993 under apartheid, the number of black males arrested 
for 100,000 was 851. Yes. Not that much more than what we're doing now with white men. United States, in, back in 2004, under prohibition, was over 4,900 people being arrested for 100,000. So again, we say legalized drugs. Number two, we'd like to say have the federal government, because they don't want to be involved in it anyway, oversee the drug production. Outcomes that we think may happen are quality control and production. <coughs> Consistency. So when somebody gets one of these drugs through the doctor, whatever, they know what they're getting. There's no surprises, no unexpected deaths. Standardized measurement and potency referring to the same thing. And hopefully an end to overdoses. Now, we know it's not going to all completely come to an end because there's always exceptions. Um, some of us older people, as we get older, we start taking a lot of medicine. We get really old. Sometimes they pick up the wrong bottle. Take too many of the wrong medicines. Accidental. Not to, and you know, it's kind of interesting. We have the FDA, speaking of government, that oversees and, and approves all these drugs that people take that are issued by doctors. And I don't know about here, but I know in Denver, Colorado, and Arizona, you'll have a lawyer advertising about every 20 minutes on the radio or on television saying, "Have you taken this drug? This FDA-approved drug? Call us." We're going to sue over your side effects and all the other bad things that happen to you by because of this FDA proof of food drug. Well, kind of interesting, I think. We'd like to see that free maintenance doses of drugs to any adult requesting them happens to help guarantee or further guarantee that the black market will occur and will have all this mayhem for people trying to buy it on the street. If you need help, come see us. That's in Switzerland. Hey, thanks. So, what are some out possible outcomes of free government distribution? No profit for drug distri uh, distribution, no individuals selling drugs in the street. We're not going to eradicate all of them because we never get rid of all of them. No crimes committed to obtain the drugs. No criminal association for drug users. No diseases passed by sharing needles. Users able to stabilize their addictions with a little help from their friendly government. And I just go to prison. No shootings of dealers by other dealers. We tend to put them out of business for the most part. No police are killed fighting the drug war. More importantly to me, just read, you read about this four or five times a month at least, no one killed by the police in drug enforcement activity. And we can save half the dog population too while we're at it. <clears throat> shoot the dog too. You know, they have a dog, even have a dog. If somebody kicked you in your door, you came in screaming and yelling at yourself with your dog bark, you know, or maybe try to bite, you know, I mean, come on, folks. No kids caught in crossfire. Back in 1986, we had what we call our summer of violence in Northeast Denver because it was the most, it was the most violent we've had since before or since. It had to do with gang activities because there was that, and they were dealing in drugs, the Reds and the Blues, the Crips and the Bloods, and to um, either get rid of competition or to scare them away, we had in those neighborhoods, these kids got weapons that the police department didn't even have. You know, fully automatic 9 millimeter submachine guns. They drive by a house and just spray it from the street in the car. And we had done at least a dozen kids, little kids, four or five, up to ten years old, lying on the couch by the front window or in the bedroom, the front bedroom, die because of this effort to discourage competition in the drug trade. It was really, it's kind of ridiculous. It's part of the drug war. I just think it's something that we need to consider when we talk about what we do about drugs. <coughs> no one soliciting more drug users. We've had cases I know in Denver, and I'm sure it's happened everywhere else, where you'll see somebody hanging around an elementary schoolyard out by the fence going, hey, come over here, i got something for you. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. It may just be marijuana. That may be where 10th graders get or even younger. Then, of course, they'll come back later and say, hey, did you like that stuff? that will make you feel good. I've got something that'll make you feel even better. And that's the hook. But now we have drug addicts because they give them something that they're going to become addicted to. That's what goes on with this policy and this underground market. We'd also like to see redirected this $88 billion to programs that will offer <coughs> people, particularly um, addicts, hope for the future. And the one that I like the best and the only one that I list anymore is rehabilitation centers. We can 
provide rehabilitation centers as they do in the Netherlands again. And give them whatever they need, get them out of the program, it'll cost a whole lot less than $88 billion. So what, uh, offering hope for the future, what does that do for people? It creates less of a need to use drugs and therefore fewer drug addicts. Redirecting the money to programs that offer the education about drugs. Talking about Switzerland real quick, since taking a public health approach to heroin and switch heroin in Switzerland, not one person in the program has died of a heroin overdose <coughs> since it was implemented. Not one. Lower rates of crime, death, and disease has dropped in expected new users and an improvement in mental and physical health. Felony crime down by more than 60%. A lot of crime is committed to uh, get the way to buy drugs. Portugal, about 12 years ago, in 2001, almost 13, decriminalized all drugs. And we, don't, we say legalized because there's a, decriminalized still has a penalty. Decriminalizing still provides a penalty. Drug use by 13 and 19 year olds in Portugal dropped by 22 to 25%. That's me. <clears throat> Heroin overdose deaths are down by 52% in Portugal in the last 12 years. HIV infections reported by drug users who shared needles and so forth is down an amazing 71% in Portugal because of the change in policy. We'd like to see, we don't recommend what changes, we'll leave that up to make people maybe smarter than we are. <clears throat> Being a bunch of ex cops and all, you know, but uh, <laughs> we'd like to see some people do some things and uh, we'd like to talk about education, and that's what we think we do is educate people about what our policy really does and what things could yes. be if we changed it. Yes. We talked about way back in 1985, yes. smoking was really a big thing. Nowadays, it's like almost illegal to smoke anywhere. You know, it's going to sit in your bathroom to smoke a cigarette and be legal almost, but you can still buy them. But back then, about 42% of the population was smoking. Since they started doing education before they made it basically illegal, but still legal somehow, and told people, this is there, here's all these reasons why you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, because it does this, it does that, the end of your life may be really miserable, and a few other things. We're down to about 21%, cut it in half. Which is about, you know, some people are just going to have bad habits, because that's, we're humans. Albert Einstein, way back, talking about prohibition, of course he was talking about alcohol prohibition, but here's what he had to say. He said, the prestige of government has undoubtedly been lowered considerably by the prohibition law, for nothing is more destructive than respect for the government and the law of the land than passing laws which cannot be enforced. It is an open secret that the dangerous increase in crime in this country is closely connected to this. And that was the days of the mob violence and so forth and so on. A little later in life, Milton Freeman, just a couple of years before he died, said, Can any policy, however high minded, be moral if it leads to widespread corruption, imprisons so many, has so racist an effect, destroys our inner cities, wreaks havoc on misguided and vulnerable individuals, and brings death and destruction to foreign countries? Just a few comments. I'd like to, I'd like okay, to show it to you, but you may have heard that our prison systems are being handed over to <coughs> private enterprises in a lot of places. But they have contracts. The contracts, because these are for-profit corporations, uh, require probably a number, certain number of beds to be filled. From the Corrections Corporation of America's annual report of a year or two ago, quote, the demand of our facilities and services could be adversely affected by the relaxation of enforcement efforts. Oh, sure. Leniency and conviction or parole standards and sentencing practices or through the decriminalization of certain activities that are currently prescribed by our criminal laws. Yes. They have a vested interest in keeping 2.3 million people a year in jail. So those are the basic facts. We can talk about a lot of things. I'm going to tell you a couple of other things that we saw happen and things that I don't talk about much because I don't have exact numbers on. But if you go to uh, Media Awareness Project, I don't know if you've heard of that or not, you can find it on, on the web. So they gather news information from all over the country and some other parts of the world. And they have MAP slice drugs. You can go to that, and they'll come up with articles that have to do with
drug activity. And there'll be letters to the editor, uh, articles of uh, whatever going on there. They, they, they find all of this in all this media. And uh, over and over and over, you'll find a newspaper article somewhere three, four, or five times a month about law enforcement. An officer being arrested, or a prison guard being arrested, or introducing contraband to a prison. Law enforcement officers for helping people get the drugs through the town and where the sellers are going to be. Because it's such a corruptive influence. It corrupts everything. Just like alcohol prohibition did way back when. That's why we are law enforcement against prohibition. We want to see it into it. We want to see a program that helps people who somehow find their way into uh, drug problems. Slow down the recruitment for people with drug problems because of the profit to get them up, get them hooked. And to get law enforcement back to doing real law enforcement. So I have a question for you. Again, if you decide that for some reason you need to pick up the phone and call the Chicago Police Department, when would you like them to show up for whatever your reason may be? Emergency or something that's really important to you may not be an emergency to cops, but it's something that disturbs you. What would you like? Would you like to see them show up when? Tomorrow? A couple of hours? No. Ten minutes? Five. Five. <laughs> This is one of the biggest things that helps slow that response time down, is diversion of police officers to fighting the war on drugs. <laughs> Why? Because every city is hurting. I just heard that uh, on the radio this week that the city of Chicago is going to try and float some more bonds, quite a, quite a hefty amount. And um, they mentioned uh, this was a public or uh, a uh, liberal talk show station. <clears throat> they said part of that is for a couple million dollars of lawsuits against the police department. And I can tell you right now, a whole bunch of that has to do with drug enforcement activity. And I also have to tell you that this $88 billion we spent on drug enforcement is an addiction of itself to law enforcement. Depending on the size of the department, it can be as much as 50% of their budget on some of the smaller departments in this country. Something very telling that when we were living in Arizona in the wintertime, where now they're full-time, but about four years ago, or more, 2008, I think it was, and everybody was having trouble, in particular Arizona, one of the states that was having a lot of trouble, real estate prices dropped, therefore taxes dropped, and so forth and so on. The uh, Pinal County Sheriff, I mean, Arizona, as big a state as it is, only has 15 counties, believe it or not. So the Sheriff's Departments have a whole lot of territory to go. Pinal County Sheriff, that's <coughs> Pima County, where I live, that's the Tucson area, said, I'm going to have to lay off a couple of police officers because I, I don't have the budget anymore. A couple of set, a couple of deputies, and I can't afford to do that. We can't handle what we have to do. Then he said, or, oh, wait, maybe I can get some of that federal drug enforcement money because apparently he didn't have time to mess with drug enforcement because he's too busy just trying to keep the sheriff's handling the other calls for service. And I thought to myself, and I almost called him up and said, well, the problem with that is you're still losing two deputies. If you're going to get that money from the feds, you're going to have to earn it to keep getting it. You're going to have to show, do some drug enforcement and put some people in prison for drugs. So you're losing them anyway. So our basic stance is we have a policy that's devastating, that doesn't work, that's hurting our youth, that's filling our prisons, and we need to make a change to something that will resolve the problems with drugs that this country seems to have. Questions, comments, please. All right. All right. First question for you okay. is from Gene Horker. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think you had this in your Maybe talk. Uh, you <laughs> just made a, a very interesting presentation. Have you written to your U.S. rep and or called him or her or and your two uh, U.S. senators and expressed your opinion about this? And if so, did they respond? We do a lot of that in our organization. We have people from all over the country who are former law enforcement, and some actually current will speak out. But sometimes they get in trouble with their agency for doing that. But uh, I have, yes. No, I, can, I haven't yet in Arizona. I take that back. I did talk to a state senator, and I, I got to talk to one congressperson so far in Arizona. But that's, that's our plan. We like to talk to these people. The reception uh, is kind of interesting. And that's something I was going to bring up here in just a couple of minutes, of some of the changes that are happening in attitude in just the last year in this country for a variety of reasons. But some of them are going to say, no, we can't do that because, you know, 
This is my impression of most politicians, not all, but most. They have a wet finger up in the air. They're testing the breeze. And there's all these groups, very, uh, not, you know, like rabid Republicans. I don't, want to, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, all right? But, you know, the ones that say, oh, you can't possibly legalize drugs, it's horrible. We have to, and I think we'll have to re-educate them a little bit about what the drug war actually does. If they may change their minds, but so. There are some that uh, just don't want to rail, rile the voters because their biggest job is to get reelected. Unfortunately, the way our system works. And if you're a Congress critter, you have to run for re-election every two years, so you're always running for a re-election. That's your first job, and then you do a little legislating here and there in between. But yes, we do try to be, talk to these people, and we try to make, like when I'm here, we try to make some uh, appointments. In fact, I spoke with three aldermen this week, Michelle Harris. And uh, Rod, uh, Roderick, um, what is his last name? Ward 6. And um, Poco Joe Moreno. All three of them are in favor of this. Now, there's 50 all of them I know. But at least, I know at least three of them say, yes, we do need to make some kind of change. So that's local legislation. Okay. If drugs were legalized, and say I was to form a company dealing in illicit substances, which would be the most profitable to invest in? <laughs> Ten. I don't know, but uh, since marijuana is the most used drug and the one that everybody wants to blame everything else on, as being the gateway drug and so forth and so on, um, let's put it this way. And we were an active part of that along with Drug Policy Alliance and a couple of other drug organizations. We were involved, especially I me, mean, I did a 30 second commercial. My kids say they saw everything. Was, they took, Every time I turn on the TV, saying vote for this amendment 64. It's important to note they really ticked off a couple of DAs. They said, "Why did you make it an amendment?" I said, "So that you guys can't mess with it without having to have another vote." That's why we decided to make an amendment that legalized marijuana. And uh, the first week of January, people came out of the woodwork to buy marijuana from state-authorized marijuana distribution points. So we already had medical marijuana. We had it for a few years since 2004. Some of them were allowed to sell marijuana to anyone 21 and over. And by the way, that's a very restricted law. It's almost as bad as trying to smoke cigarettes. You can get it. You can go to the store and get it. Take it home. Smoke it at home. Don't smoke it in your car. Don't smoke it in public. It's very restricted, but it is legal. You're not going to ruin anybody's life over it. So now, if a young person gets arrested in Colorado, hopefully, it'll be like kind of like having an underage drink or cigarettes underage. Because now when you're 18 or over in most of the country and you get busted for a little bit of marijuana, it doesn't matter, just a little bit, you may go to jail. Now it's not going to be 15, 20 years like it used to be. They've got lightened up on marijuana now and lately. But it's on your record. You can't get a college loan or scholarship if you have a marijuana arrest. You can't get a whole raft of jobs even though you may get a college education because that's on your record. It's permanent. That's the way people look at it. You have your arrest. You're a druggie. Ah, oh, it smokes marijuana. That's on your record. We can't hire you. So those are some of the effects. So what would you sell? Back to that question. Colorado, the state, through taxation, in the, first, in the month of January, the first month that this happened, and I realize we had crowds coming from everywhere else, and that'll, that'll slow down a little bit. The state made almost $4 million in tax collections in one month from the sale of marijuana. Marijuana, the marijuana people about, ran out about the first week. They had to go to some other growers because they can grow their own, but they had to go buy it from somebody else. And then it gets taxed twice, from a grower to the seller and from the seller to the uh, purchaser. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Uh, although I heard about this topic, there's always something new, and I appreciate the numbers. Do you include in um, the $88 billion, do you include the tax loss that we could gain uh, with legalizing? That's one question. The second is uh, the barriers. The most important thing is, I mean, it's so obvious and it's so common sense and it's right there, and yet legalizing is very difficult. Um, what are the barriers and how do we really, uh, other than political politicians' corruption, uh, the underworld, the prison industry, and the moralizing, the, the moral right. 
is there anything else that stops us from doing the common sense thing? Aside from the fact that it's been against the law for 43 years, uh, and trying to convince politicians. Now, since you brought that up, politicians who don't seem to be of a mind for the most part to change things, but uh, as you may have seen, and uh, I talked about air one, and we talked about the deaths that have occurred uh, back east here in the last couple of weeks because somebody spiked the heroin. A couple of things have happened here. Wait a Sorry. Just one of those things is just in. You're okay. One of the actors who played McGruff, the crime dog, was sentenced to 16 years for drug possession. <laughs> <laughs> he had a thousand pot plants in his house. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of interesting, though. They saw that on the news. I'm always digging around in the news. Okay? Yeah. January 1, Colorado began allowing persons 20 or over to become eligible to buy marijuana for the first time anywhere. See, I was our traffic control, as I mentioned. But here's some of the real results that they're already looking at in Colorado. There will be jails less crowded. And part of that is included in the amendment that people voted on is that a bunch of this tax money will go to help fund schools better than what they're funded now. And police are now able to not worry about the marijuana user or try to get a bone up and try to get some kind of promotion by busting marijuana users. Now they can be better able to answer calls for service, which we talked about before. They're free chasing marijuana because, frankly, as we showed you in the stats, they don't chase much else. The state of Washington has also had that. Let me finish just a couple of these developments. It's, it's brought it up. So. And here's some uh, luminaries that have come out recently. President Obama said something about, I think we ought to see what uh, kind of happens. Maybe these are experimental labs, Colorado and Washington. Let's just kind of see what's happening in those states and not go in there with the feds and say, we don't care, it's still against our law, which is what they usually do. So they said, well, as long as you behave yourselves, whatever that actually means, then we'll let you try this out for a while. Since then, anybody know who Rick Perry is? Yes. Governor of Texas, right? Yeah, I'm not good. He's come out and said that at a, at a forum, a public forum, he said, I think we ought to think about changing our drug policy because it, it doesn't work. It's kind of bad news all the way around. So he said that. Uh, Chris Christie, New Jersey's governor, who stepped in a little doo doo here in the last <laughs> week, something about a bridge over troubled water or something like that. <laughs> he said, in essence, the same thing. I think we ought to um, take another look at how we deal with the drug problem in this country. The president, of course. The DEA, the head of the DEA, the top two people in the DEA, they just got mad. They basically accused Obama of going nuts and he said, maybe we should take a look at this and see what happens. Because as I've shown you, their whole business is marijuana. And if we legalize marijuana, then, you know, maybe we can hire them on the real police departments if we train them because all they know is about kicking indoors and shooting dogs. But that's just what I, I shouldn't say that. We have some former DEA people in our group now. That used to work for the DEA, and they said, believe me, we know how bad this is. It's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Anyway, more questions. But she can ask yes, also uh, a statistic as to whether the lost, your, you cited a statistic. Well, the 88, the 88 billion, that's just the cost to U.S. taxpayers of the enforcement policy, enforcing the policy. That's all it is. It doesn't mean the cost of not. The loss of tax due to. Well, there's no tax involved right now. So if right. you wanted to throw in the loss of taxes, say Colorado, which has less population than you guys have here, <laughs> right? They figured, they, they guesstimated it's probably going to be better that they would get $67 million a year in taxes. That's just to the state coffers. That's not to the cities who can have their own tax wow. besides that. So I don't know, it's inestimable, I think, what the tax reversal could be. Instead of spending $88 billion, I think you're going to see two or three times that. That's just a... A guesstimate, just based on what Colorado says. David, then Ernie, then Pat. This doesn't reflect my point of view, but it's one I've heard before, as I'm sure you have too. What do you say to the moralists who say, well, if we legalize marijuana, then we'll, then we'll, then they'll graduate to pot, I mean, graduate to LSD and that cocaine and all the rest of this stuff. It's true. Yeah. Well, the first answer is that's already happened. Okay. Well, it's illegal. So for the most people, I think there are those who want to experiment in whatever are probably going to experiment in whatever. And again, I think that's a matter of education. It's a matter of parenting. I'm saying, you know, there's some things out there that you really ought to think about. 
And if we're going to have an education program, we had the D.A.R.E. program. You know, if you remember that or not, you might have yeah. had children. Oh. Yeah. Was, all those kids grew up to tell us, you guys lied to us in the D.A.R.E. program, especially about marijuana, because in fact they did lie. They took the government's propaganda and told the kids that, and then the kids figured out it's not true. It's not true. So we could do an education program that says, here's why it would be a bad idea for you, because here's really what will happen if you get into some really bad drugs. I would say that any drug, which includes alcohol, is not a good choice. A lot of people are going to make them. That's just my own personal choice in life, as of the last four years. And so, it's not a good idea. Why mess with yourself? You know? But that's just me. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Bernie? Yeah. Uh, how, many, uh, how many jobs? I've been told, of course, one of the reasons that it's hard to do this is there's a huge number of jobs with a lot of people that have it vested interest, not just the owners of the prisons, but the people they employ, the, all the people who work with the different police departments, etc. Do you have any estimate of the number of jobs? I've heard the figure a million jobs are dependent on this. I don't know if that's true, but do you have any kind of figure of uh, jobs that are fully or partially dependent on the war on drugs? Would go away if the war on drugs went away? Well, I don't have the exact number of people who are in prisons for like <clears throat> marijuana because sometimes we're not imprisoning them like we used to. No, I mean, yeah, but the job, the <clears throat> police officers. The prison, the police, and all that. Well, how, many, how many people who have jobs that um, depend on... Let me put it this way. If police officers didn't, uh, weren't uh, as vested as some departments are in, in pursuing the war on drugs, okay. they could actually fight real crime. I could pay more attention to the other crimes. And we could maybe have a better solution rate for homicide or for child molestation. You know, they, back early in my career, I decided this was a bogus program because I would see child molesters, which I'm going to tell you what, I don't care what a psychologist tells tell you, there's no cure for that. It's something in the brain. It's wiring. Okay? They can get out after seven or eight years with somebody with marijuana went to prison for 20 years. And so what you have with a child molester, for instance, is you get away with it or they go to jail for a while. For a while. And, um, and they come back out, and pretty soon they can't help themselves. They're going to do it again. So they go back to jail or prison for a while. And then they come out, and pretty soon not only do you have a molested child, but they're kidnapped and murdered because these guys are tired of getting caught. So they think if they get rid of the evidence, that they won't go back to prison. And it's just me, but the child molester, I would walk him into prison and walk him into the main population and say, hey, guys, here's a child molester. Welcome in. Because they won't last two weeks. Because criminals don't like child molesters either. <laughs> so that's just me. But you know, there's some things that we can concentrate on. Maybe we should take some of these large sentences for people that are more violent to society than drug users. All right, Patrick. Yeah. How much involvement does what's left of the mob uh, have in uh, the drug trade? And uh, if we did, uh, if we did decriminalize uh, the drug industry. Would that have the double benefit of dismantling uh, the outfits and forcing them to find uh, new job opportunities? Well, like the mob and the Mexican cartels, they have a variety of things that they have their hands in. So there's uh, human trafficking, there's prostitution, um, which is also prohibited. No kind of a libertarian on that one, too. You know, just get it off the streets, make it legal. You know, if you have a bad habit and, it, and it, something bad happens to you, that's because you made the choice. But to some people who go, oh my God, you know, what are you talking about? But that's just, but the point is, there are lots of other things for these people to get into, and they're already into them. It's just so we can limit some of their activity. They don't have to concentrate harder on these other things they do, and then we can see what we can do about the people that they victimize with the other trades that they engage in. Yes, uh, He's in charge. <laughs> uh, Charlie? Yeah, Tony gave all sorts of figures there. 1933, the government legalized the drug, and have there been any costs attendant? Uh, what is the cost of alcohol every year to our society? Does it take police away from arresting people? Does it is there, is there any absenteeism that's increased that decreases productivity, or is there 
any increased dropout rates if we legalize drugs. The UI is always a problem, always has been. I mean, we do have experience with having legalized the drug. What's that evidence? Okay, you know, with alcohol, you know, I was talking about education, okay? So here, uh, quite a few years ago now, we decided to, somebody decided to tell the, uh, the makers and purveyors of alcohol, why don't you do, uh, help us out here, make life a little safer for people. I, I used to investigate reconstruct traffic, fatal trucking accidents before I became a supervisor, and uh, a lot of drunk driving causing accidents. Back in the 70s, drunk drivers killed around 60,000 people a year in this country, countrywide, about 60,000 people. That number, with a great many more miles being driven, and of course cars are a little bit safer, but because of education mostly, get a designated driver, mothers against drunk drivers, so forth and so on, the number's down to between 30 and 35,000 a year. Because now, it's not a laughing matter. Joe is so drunk, I don't know how he ever got his car home. Now it's, Joe, don't try it. We'll try it. We'll bring you back to your car tomorrow or something. So people are educated. They're feeling more responsible because people are willing to talk about it and not hide it under the rug like they used to. So in terms of that, um, alcohol is a huge money maker. It hasn't made any less money than it ever did before. It probably makes a lot more. And um, frankly, you want to talk about alcohol? It's alcohol use. Probably keeps about 50% of your police department employed because that's the drug that causes calls for police service. Well, it's involved in domestic violence, child abuse, all kinds of things. It, it's certainly invalid to compare one drug with another. Is, is marijuana advances perhaps, let's say, more benign? Or is there another way of saying that? Yeah. Mm. Well, let me put it this way. I'm a Denver Broncos fan. <clears throat> Broncos have had some pretty good seasons. They get to the playoffs quite a few times. And um, we had a very important game, a playoff game or something, uh, that the Broncos did like they did in the Super Bowl. I guarantee you, the police department was ready because the missing violence calls must have gone through the roof after that game. Because the husbands are sitting around drinking, and the worse it gets, the more they drink. And then the wife says, all those guys are a bunch of donkeys anyway, and there you are. And he's drunk. Now, if a guy's sitting there puffing a little bit of pot while he's watching the game, <laughs> and she says that, he's going to go, oh, come on, honey, let's give him a break from here. Try some of this. <laughs> it's not going to pound her into the car, but okay, that's the difference. We don't get calls, domestic violence, because somebody used marijuana. In fact, in all my years of experience of working the street, over 30 years of being on the streets of Denver, in poor neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, we don't get called about marijuana unless somebody's mad at them and wants to turn them in. Because they don't cause trouble. They don't cause trouble. Now, if they're having it, if they run out of munchies and they're doing serious marijuana smoking, they may need to go out and drive their car. But I maintain this because I've seen it actually. Someone's a little higher than they should be maybe on marijuana, but you know, certainly if they cause an accident because of, and they don't have the real science on what's really bad that way on marijuana, but they're working on it. Um, that's why he's going to go to the nearest 7-Eleven store to get some munchies and then came back home. In the meantime, they come up to stop, so they're going to stop 50 feet behind it and sneak up on them. And they don't want to get stopped, okay? I mean, literally, I've seen that actually happen. They go, there's a guy that's been smoking, you know, because who else does that, you know? So those are the differences. Alcohol is a big bugaboo. They tried to get rid of it once. It didn't work. All we can do now is drink all you want, but if you do something wrong, as a result of drinking, you just being ah, the guy was drunk, come on, huh? too bad. You still shouldn't do whatever it is you did, drive your car, meet your wife, whatever. Alcohol is not an excuse, so that's how we look at it. So that's that's our response to that, law enforcement. Uh, Karina Shushan. Uh, sir, with all due respect, you're retired and so is Jim Drake. Um, how do you get more, stop the pattern where officers will... Uh, enforce the drug laws, and then after they retire, join law enforcement against prohibition. <clears throat> well, not quite sure what you're asking there, but <clears throat> an officer is sworn to uphold the laws of the land. It's part of their oath that they take. But you know, there are you know, 50,000 laws in every state. About 4,000 of them get enforced on a regular basis. Maybe not even that many. Officers still have, believe it or not, incredible choices to make in what they do and what they enforce. 
some guys don't care about writing tickets unless somebody's an obvious hazard because they feel, as I used to, in the neighborhoods, especially when I was a sergeant or a lieutenant, nobody cared if I wrote a ticket anymore. There's not really a, that I know of, there's not really a, what do you want to call it, a quota. There's just an expectation that you're certainly going to see some traffic violations that are worth writing tickets on. But in minority neighborhoods, it's more valuable to pull somebody over because they're driving a little worse than they should be. It turns out that as the vast majority of them, believe it or not, have, they have their license, they have their insurance. My wife said I was always evil because if they had a woman, a woman with them, I'll tell you about that. I'd say, I just want to advise you, sir, that you're driving a little strange and one of my troops could write you a ticket, but I just want you to pay attention to what you're doing and uh, drive better and have a nice day and give that license back to them because a white cop didn't write a minority person a ticket and it's worth its weight in gold in terms of building relationships with those communities. But they realize I'm not being written because they're brown or black or whatever. I'm different. And I think that was worth its weight in gold, and that's when I tried to tell the officers to work for me. I don't have a ticket quota. You want to write tickets, go to traffic. But it seems that um, people won't join LEAP until they retire. It's really hard in most departments to speak out openly. You can, as long as you make it clear that you're not talking on behalf of your department. But that's why there's a separation. We had a case about four years ago with a sergeant in Seattle, or in the department around Seattle, who went and made a presentation. He joined the league and made a presentation on his own time, not in uniform, but his department fired him. He said, that's not our policy. You're talking against, you're talking about illegal substances yeah, and not enforcing those laws. He sued. He got back pay, he got 100000 plus, and got his job back. Because the court said, what he does in his own time and what his opinions are in his own time, yeah. oh man. But no, there's that pressure, so these guys, most of these guys aren't going to do that because they don't want to go through that hassle, just to prove the point. So, But um, we just have a guy from Wisconsin, a sheriff, he just joined last year, the end of last year. He was a sheriff for 20 years in the county of Wisconsin. And his attitude was, I'm too busy to do this. And when they retired, he didn't have to worry about people voting against him because he said, I'm not in favor of this drug war. Came right out and started with us and said, yeah, I'm all for this, let this. So there's, uh, that's why, mainly, there's too much pressure, too much to go through to, to upset your higher-ups. Okay, you Darryl Weinberg, did you have a question? <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's not uh, <laughs> Is there anything about white people and put you in marijuana versus black people using marijuana? And would you say, do you think that the percentages are roughly the same? Of a, for use? Yeah, we have a place in Denver that's called Five Points. It's called that because you have a bunch of that here and I'm just driving around. A bunch of streets come together in one place. You come from this angle, this angle, this angle. You're trying to figure out where to go, you don't know which way to turn, you know, even with your GPS on the face, you know, unless you live here. But uh, it's called Five Points because that was the gathering point and all the bars and so forth for the uh, black neighborhood people to go to. And uh, all kinds of stuff going on in there. And uh, most of these drug arrests were made in those neighborhoods. But you could always tell. And so this white kid was out looking for drugs because you'd have a Mercedes convertible driving through five points. You know, he's either looking for a prostitute or he's looking for drugs. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there. So you stop him. You got any drugs? But um, the point really is this. There aren't near as many white people going to prison or jail for drugs. So yes, it's a racist policy. It was when it was started, especially with marijuana. Marijuana started out in the 30s. Harry Anslinger saying, you know, we, and, and um, Jay Randolph Hearst and a couple of those people, he didn't want him to interfere with his newspaper products. He said, those people over there are smoking marijuana and they're coming over here and they're raping our women and all that kind of stuff. We have to put a stop to this. So, yeah, this whole history is about racism. Uh, Martin Keith. <coughs> you mentioned that you would talk to the aldermen here, to some of the aldermen here. Uh, do your opponents have an active lobbying effort? Your opponents being the people who've got a big financial stake in making sure that the war keeps going. <coughs> I assume that that includes the prison corporations and perhaps the cartels from Mexico. Well, I read you the statement that uh, 
uh, Corrections Corporation of America put out. It's a strong hint there because they know that there's a move to legalize marijuana and then go on to other substances. So they're squeaking already. I mean, yeah. are, are they making political contributions to advance their their well, position? And, and are the cartels <clears throat> filtering some money in? I'm sure they're not happy with Colorado and Washington. Cartels, um, right. put it this way. They sure got some it's, money. It's a known fact that there are members of Mexican drug cartels housed in at least 1,200 of our cities in this country. At least 1,200 of our cities have cartel lieutenants in their cities. But uh, I don't know about advertising about that. I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. All right, Don. Yes, I grew up in the 1930s, early 1940s, and uh, I've heard about heroin, but I never knew anybody was on heroin. They never talked about it. The alcohol, yes, is all I'm talking about. But they never talked about it. I don't know. The problem in those days? Well, you know, they didn't talk about drugs very much either <clears throat> until recently. Tell some people, you know, way, way back when you had a marijuana policy project, they've been around for a while, trying to talk about marijuana. You know, this is ridiculous. Let's try to legalize marijuana. People looked at them cross-eyed, you know, but now they're a big part of this. And they're, they're readily accepted now where they weren't 10, 12 years ago. Um, Drug Policy Alliance has been around for a long time. A bunch of anti-drug law people meeting almost in secret, for the most part, until frankly, until we came along, and they thought, wow. In fact, they were MPP and Drug Policy Alliance were some of our first funders. They said, really? A bunch of cops are going to talk about this, and they're going to say this is a bad policy? They were all for it, because they weren't getting any money. I'm not saying that we're a miracle, but it seems to bear a little more weight. The people who have been there, done that, and seen how it actually works, and come out and say, we need to change this. So alcohol, everybody knows that alcohol is bad, and yet nobody quit drinking. You know what I to tell you the truth, what I'd rather see my old college, University of Colorado, CU up in Boulder, Colorado, every year, at the beginning of the year, the frat houses will have parties and the, the little chickies will come around, you know, and so forth and so on. And almost every year they'll find a young lady, 18, 19 years old, dead in a closet in a frat house because she drank too much. Because she really hadn't hardly ever drunk in her life at all. And then she went crazy at a party, and they found her dead the next morning. Some of those places they smoke marijuana, and nobody's been found dead in a closet because they smoke marijuana. Okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, see, the thing that's legal is far worse than most of the illegal stuff. And I don't advocate heroin either, but you know, you know that, that percentage of heroin is, is really low. So it's really low compared to. All right, Ernie Norman. Yeah, nobody else has a question on this. I have a question uh, for our guest uh, who is from Colorado, not Illinois, about a different topic that has been covered here at the college. And I want to get his opinion. Uh, Illinois just became the 50th state of 50 to legalize concealed carry. I know Colorado's had it longer, and as a police officer, what is your opinion on that topic? Quick quote. An armed society is a safe society. <clears throat> if that doesn't sum it up for you, it didn't used to be that way in Colorado. Um, we don't have open carry, Arizona does. Arizona has less time than Colorado. And it's got, Phoenix is a whole lot bigger than Denver, <laughs> yeah. population wise. What happened to that congresswoman? Which one? We got shot. Yeah, difference. She's still around and she's getting better. And this is what the anti-gun people use as the one weird guy that does something, but you know, it's like, they don't talk about that like drug drivers, but oh my goodness, the gun, the anti-gun people go nuts. Somebody yeah, shoots somebody. That's another shoot. Mm -hmm. But will the crime go down? Aren't, uh, yeah, well, of course it's going to go down. If, if the bad guys think that you might be able to shoot them, they're going to think twice, okay? And you know, it's like crime. I had a shootout with a bank robber. I got shot through the chest in the days before we had this, and so forth. But every time a police officer had to defend himself, and shot somebody because they were shooting at him. Crime went down because somebody, a bad guy, got shot, and they rethink about whether or not they want to commit a crime because the cops might actually show up before it's over. And so that always has that effect. And that's what happens whether it's a cop or somebody else that kills somebody rightfully in defense of themselves or somebody else. Time goes down when cops yeah. shoot people. Tim, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I just, I just have to ask, which one's better, Sensimayan or Hawaiian? <laughs> 
I don't know, I don't use it. Okay. <laughs> I can't tell you I know some people do, I can send you an answer, I guess. Okay. Yeah, Lieutenant, what's the value of concealed carry over open carry? Uh, both are supposed to be a deterrent, but if I were a potential criminal watching some guy walking down the street, I have to make a guess as to whether or not he's carrying. If, on the other hand, there's someone walking down the street and you can see uh, that he is, in fact, carrying, I'm less likely to feel lucky, as uh, Clint Eastwood said. Uh, I'm going to back off. I would say it depends on whether the, uh, the would be criminal has been using drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I see your point, and I think, I think you have a good point. I think open carry probably is more of a deterrent than concealed carry. On the other hand, as I said before, if somebody has concealed carry and somebody tries to mess with them and they shoot them, even if they don't kill them, the crime rate still goes down. Because they think, wait a minute, some of these people have guns, we, we can't tell. So then they go, but then they get bolder because they have the reasons for committing crime, so then they'll get back at it. But it always slows crime down when somebody defends himself lawfully. Somebody breaks into a house and the owner wakes up with a shotgun, you know. <laughs> Charlie paid up. Yeah, it's one thing, Tony, for police officers to have guns, but I have a loony neighbor. And he has guns. And do you think he told me that he is authorized to enforce the laws of the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois? Do you, why do you think I should respond to this? Is he duly authorized to shoot people? Depends on uh, what Illinois law actually says. Because in some circumstances, people are authorized to assist police. And in some cases, they're actually encouraged if they see an officer having trouble to go ahead and step in and help out. Not very many people do, for a variety of reasons, but they can. And um, if, you're, if you see somebody in trouble and you have a weapon and, uh, and they're being attacked with the weapon, in Colorado, you have the right to use your weapon to defend somebody else inside or outside your home. So he's got a right to protect his house and shoot anybody who might be a threat? Well, they the can't be outside just screaming and yelling and calling him names, but if they kick in the door or something, sure. Probably. I don't know Illinois law, but I know Colorado. Thanks a lot, Doug. Yeah, Illinois. Well, no, appreciate it. Yeah. Some <laughs> states, like Texas, are allowed to shoot okay. someone trying to steal Thanks, your car. Well, Texas is really gun crazy. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Question. Uh, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a good idea. One of the goals of your organization is to get people treatment. Um, does your organization have any opinion over what treatment is effective? And I ask this from the point of view that it seems to me that uh, drug addicts go into residential treatment and then relapse, go back, relapse, mm -hmm. go back, relapse, go back. And do you know of any scientific method that works or helps that is effective? There are so many variables in, in the, like, for what they're using. For I would maintain that there's, for the most part, no addiction to marijuana, although some people will say there is. And I say that's kind of like having a bad eating habit. There's, that's an addiction, but it's, a, you know, it's kind of a psychological thing or whatever. Um, and uh, a lot of people are in the rehab business to make money. <coughs> if they are really successful at it, the customer doesn't come back. So there may be some of that going on. Um, and I know there's all these all kinds of people saying we're, gonna, we're rehabbing kids all over the place for marijuana use. And the stats tell us, not really, not really. They're going to toy with it and they're going to do something else. You know, they may graduate to something else if somebody tries to hook them on something else. But they're just challenging, you know, as all of us did when we were teenagers, you're challenging the rules to see, to see how far you can get or to see what the results are. If your dad says, you know, you want to try that again, I can make more just like it. Bill Cosby, his dad, he talks about that. So it all depends. There's a lot of just way, way too many variables to actually predict that for sure. But if you're going to um, demand that the government pay for treatment, you don't have any type of scientifically-based treatment that you could prescribe. 
Well, that's why we offer suggestions. We don't demand. We just say, here are some possible ways to deal with this. We're not, we're not trying to develop a new policy. Okay. We're, just, we're just speaking that we need to change the one we have. So that's up to better minds than us to figure out that. Uh, you need to involve doctors and psychological people and so forth and so on and get them together and see if you can come up with some kind of consensus on what may work. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see, Wes. Uh, uh, I suppose uh, you wouldn't support requiring uh, all police employees to take a drug test. Well, as a matter of fact, it's a state law in most states. Random drug test for law enforcement. I mentioned partly when partner I was retired for a while, I was driving charter buses, because I used to do that in the old days, just for the heck of it. And uh, bus drivers and truck drivers required random drug testing. <clears throat> and if you get caught with even marijuana in your system, by the way, it's in your system for 28 days. But the active ingredient is only in your system for about eight hours, so they're still working on proving that. But uh, if, you have, if you get a random test and you have alcohol, or drugs, specifically marijuana, you're out of a job. You're going to lose your chauffeur's license or CDL now. Just like that, you're out of work. Uh, Andy Anderson. Yes. Uh, can you, in your experience as a law enforcement uh, officer over many years, do you, can you see any relationship between the increase or decrease in crime rates? relative to how the economy is going. If there's more people unemployed, out of work, if people are more depressed than normal, compared to, say, what you mentioned in the Scandinavian countries, where they have a much better social safety net and structure. Violence is less over there than here. Do you think it's related to economic conditions at all? Economics are always a part of that equation. As I, made, as I hinted to before, a lot of your crime and a lot of your drug and, and substance abuse, whatever it is, uh, happens more in, in poor, poor communities. The people live in trailer parks, it could be minority communities, they have less income, they have less standing in society. Their, their sort of jobs are going to go first if things get tight. And some, for some reason, and I'm not a psychologist, although I had some psychology in college, for some reason people that are poor seem to make more bad choices. And so they do the smoking and they do the drinking and they buy this, all these things that keep them from buying as much food as they should need, or maybe even keep them from paying the rent on time. But that's what they do. And that doesn't matter whether it's just what some people might call a white trash trailer park, which is just how people that happen to be white, or the black community, or the Hispanic community, or any other community where the income levels and so forth are just low. They're going to make more decisions, and they're going to make more calls for police work no matter what. But when the economy goes bad, that's going to be worse than this. All right, Ayala. Um. I can see that as a police, I, I meant, your, your interest in guns is to, as a deterrent to crime. It will lower crime. There is another side, and that is all the impulsive um, people with a gun, domestic uh, violence, accidental finding of guns, and school shooting by psychopath. So what is the rate of, do you know, if you compare the two, which is how much does it really, the availability of gun deters compared to the crime, the crime, the shooting and the death that are caused by the availability of guns? Well, guns are kind of like drugs. We have stringent laws in some places against them. And where they do allow guns, it's age restricted. And somehow people still get them. I believe that uh, weapons are pretty much against the law here in Chicago, aren't they? For the most part. And yet, we have some of the highest crime rate involving guns at any point in the Because it's still, it'll still happen. And it depends again, and that's usually where, again, in the poorer neighborhoods. Okay. I mean, there is a benefit. <coughs> There is a benefit, it might deter criminals, and there is a cost, which is the misuse of guns due to the availability. Can we compare the cost to the uh, cost benefits? Benefit? I would say maybe color or maybe uh, maybe Chicago notwithstanding, I'm not sure. I can't tell you for sure. But uh, I think generally speaking, where you allow people to have weapons, along with that you require that they have some training in the use of those weapons. Okay, 
that, generally speaking, you'll have less gun violence because people who want to use guns against other people sort of have to think about, unless, of course, they're already high on drugs or something, you have to think about somebody might shoot back. And that, I think that that, uh, as I said before, the, the phrase they use of guns, you know, every time a police officer gets to shoot out, and the guy gets shot up by the police, rightfully so, because of self-protection, crime goes down for probably at least a month. You know, robberies and so forth, those guys in the cops will come from shooters, you know, who don't want to do that. So oh, I think knowing they're out there will slow some people down. I may. The crazy on drugs or alcohol or something, you know. that may not make a difference. So there are, there's myriad factors involved in that. There's not a, there's not a set rule for that. Much well, like just being human. There's really not a set rule for what humans will do when, you know, so. So my Louie neighbor just needs a little training. <laughs> All right. No, if he's that Louie, I think she's... There's the course that's going to work. Uh, Ali send a letter to Tom Dart to tell him that. There's a course. <laughs> Just take a course. Oh, you are in a rubber room. You're the most rebuttal period. Stick to the rubber room. Uh, you can take a rest now. Yay, hey, very good. Yeah. 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 Can um, yeah, I'll keep time. Hang on, up. Let me. Uh... saying that uh, our drug problem would be a lot less of a problem if we educated our young people in school about drugs and the effects of drugs uh, and not lie to them. When I was a young boy, about 16 or 17, uh, Lyndon Johnson had authorized a uh, an investigation into the effects of marijuana. The findings, according to the Lyndon Johnson administration, were that if you use marijuana, you would be likely to have children with birth defects. And uh, this was a very scary thing for any boy who is, let's say, 16 or 17 years old. Later, I learned that uh, the finding of his investigation was absolutely the opposite of that, but Lyndon Johnson refused to go along with that, so they just made up the thing about the birth defects. Uh, that made a lot of young people angry, including myself, who then went out and smoked marijuana. <laughs> of course, by that time, I was about 22 years old. How many years ago was that? <laughs> hey. A long time ago. Okay. Uh, so the education thing would, if, if we showed uh, footage of people who took uh, marijuana, I mean, who took uh, heroin, and uh, over the years, and then showed what these people look like after so many years, I think young people would say, "Boy, that guy really looks like hell," and so I don't want to do heroin. Uh, the mafia is an organization that is interested in making money. Uh, and do they traffic in illegal drugs? Yes. Do they traffic in, say, the shipments of potatoes? Probably. Uh, the mafia, when I was a kid, they were real big with cigarette machines and cigarettes. Both were perfectly legal, but they uh, did a big business with that because 
it, they made money with it. I frankly, I'd rather see the mafia involved in uh, something that is legal than in something that is illegal. Uh, I think that addiction, drug addiction, should be looked on as a medical problem and not a criminal problem, and that also is the the uh, libertarian point of view on that. Uh, I understand uh, from about 10 years or so ago they came across a plant uh, that is native to South America that uh, held great promise in helping people with their addictions. It uh, had some way of helping them mentally disconnect from, uh, from their drug addiction, but I never heard any more about that. Uh, we live in a country that is supposed to be all about freedom, and yet they take most of our freedoms away from us. Individuals are supposed to be uh, sovereign over their own lives, and yet we're told you can't take drugs, you can't do this, and you can't do that. Uh, those are bad, we know best, you don't, and so forth, and uh, we're supposed to be the sovereign people that make up our, that are supposed to be allowed to make up our own mind whether or not we want to take drugs, patronize a prostitute, gamble, or anything like that, and all of those things are basically against the law. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a sad case, really. They, uh, uh, did the thing in the 1920s with prohibition, and then uh, they did the thing in the 1920s with prohibition, and then they turn around, and and today when we compare that with the 1920s, people will say, well, uh, we we didn't learn our lesson from prohibition. They learned the lesson only too well. You've got big shots in politics, senators and congressmen and so forth who are becoming billionaires from the illegal drug trade. They don't want it to be legal. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I should say that uh, I'm, I don't smoke. I smoked one cigarette when I was 10 years old, never went back, thank heaven. I'm a social drinker. I drink about one drink a, uh, a week, roughly, and uh, I never tried illegal uh, drugs. I got some prescription drugs that I take regularly. Uh, two books uh, I would suggest. One is uh, Last Call. It's the history of prohibition here in the United States. Uh, the PBS also had a series and I got the DVDs and watched them several times. So, uh, you know, that's, that gives a good background. I think anybody who went through, uh, read those, that book and went through that would say, why didn't we legalize drugs? Uh, uh, I've written letters, uh, at least once, letter to my uh, state, uh, U.S. rep and uh, the two senators. As my recollection is I got one response from Senator Durbin and he didn't agree to, with me that uh, drugs should be legalized and we should end the uh, war on drugs. Uh, uh, what to do now? Well, of course, I, I believe whether you think it uh, helps or not. It's a good way to start is to write to your U.S. rep or see, uh, see him or her face to face. And the same with the senators and say, hey, if you believe in legalizing drugs, that's what you should uh, say. And uh, I'll try to remember, or I won't be here next week, but uh, two weeks from now, I'll try to remember to bring that, my letter and, uh, you know, copy of my letter and, a copy of the uh, response that I got uh, here. My, what I think we ought to do is to uh, legalize drugs, uh, regulate them, uh, tax them very heavily, and the fourth thing is provide treatment. Now we do three of these uh, fairly well with 
alcohol, we don't do very well on the treatment. There, there are not easy uh, treatment uh, uh, programs that you can get into. That isn't going to save everybody, but it would save a lot of people if they're able to get in very easily into uh, treatment. So I would say legalize, uh, regulate, uh, heavily tax, and uh, uh, treat. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gene. Charlie uh, Pedro. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you want to use the mic? Huh? Are you going to? Oh. All right. I'll, I'll jump up here. All right, let's thank again our speaker for a nice presentation. Yeah. Coming all the way here from Denver on a snowy evening. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the topic because I think it's going to be decided by a, uh, an element of the population known as the soccer moms in suburbia. If you can convince them that drugs can be legalized, then Johnny won't become uh, an addict and nefarious character. Uh, that's pretty good. But that's a segment of the community that you're going to have to deal with. And they're the deciding officials on this. So I'm going to go off script here. And I'm going to talk about something I actually know something about. There was a question raised about this gentleman speaking, and the representatives of his organization uh, speaking even though they were retired. You do not have the right of free speech, and this applies to whether you're a union, civil servants, or whatever, uh, regarding conditions of your employment, the situation. You're not a spokesperson. Uh, simply because you are off the company property does not mean you have no, it's called the nexus, a connection between your job and what you do on the outside. You cannot have a fight on the company property or off the clock and think that it, you're not going to sub, be subject to discipline. I defended my good friend the Indian paddle mine up in Wisconsin because he thought he could get in a fight in a bar with his boss and not get in any trouble and beat him up. That's not how it works. It's called a nexus. If they can establish a connection between what you do on the outside, let's see, even if you're convicted of a crime, and certainly talking to the media, you are not a spokesperson for your employer. You should know that Butler, when people, they send you to the media rep or something like that. Uh, that's why he runs into it all the time. Now, there's also a thing called whistleblower protection. People sometimes are whistleblower, like this guy that's in, uh, that somebody uh, pulled a thing with the documents. Uh, some occasions there's whistleblower protection. I wouldn't act on it. Uh, other constraints, he's a civil service employee here in their Hatch Act, with what is called political constraints. Uh, believe you me, I just was reading an article again with the federal employees can or cannot do, and I've lived with that for many, many years. A new area is emails, social media. I was negotiating a nationwide policy on this, that what you put even in an email, this gentleman, let's say he's a police officer, on an email or social media could in fact get him fired. All it takes is one. If a federal employee sends out a political email, it's, called, it's considered like dis distributing pamphlets to all his co-workers or within his unit, he in fact can be fired. He does not have free speech on them. Okay, but that's basically it, because it, the whole thing is called a nexus. Okay. What you do on the outside, if they can establish a connection, you in fact can be subject to discipline. This applies everywhere, and removal and so forth will be sustained. It's, it's a tough... They actually, there was another one that came up talking about drugs. The guy was in the military. He was caught growing marijuana in his backyard, and they fired him because they said he was likely to, to sell the drugs on the base. Now, is that a strong nexus? I believe he got his job back. Um, let's see, regarding drug testing... Oh, by the way, Drug testing, I was involved in that too, and it's an onset. This drug testing, random drug testing, was an idea to deputize all the employers in the United States very quickly, give them all a badge, 
and they would test all these people and, and so forth. And it was a way of expanding the law enforcement community. So now your employer um, would be administering drug testing and, and affecting drug policy. Uh, guns, uh, I'm sorry, training is not like some miraculous thing that you take a complete idiot <coughs> and give them some training and they are now a law enforcement officer. No, that just doesn't happen. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good teacher, but I could be defeated by trying to teach some of, some of you guys about guns. And last of all, about drugs. I, not too long ago, I was in Denver, and you guys did uh, liberalize uh, the uh, drug uh, marijuana thing. The only thing I happened to notice, I was traveling around, I was going to that, they have the biggest hobby shop, they claim, choo-choo train, model trains, but I was traveling over there, and I traveled to a relatively poor part of Denver. It'd be something if you want, like the old love town, or something like that, but I noticed some guy took a corner building and he put a sign up that it was like a marijuana pharmacy. Uh -huh. The only thing is, it was just like kind of a sign that you would get painted down the block. Or, it wasn't a pharmacy, you know. Just didn't have the appearance of, you know, a CVS. <laughs> yeah, you, don't, you don't know how strange the marijuana drawer are. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, he opened up a pharmacy in the neighborhood. Thanks a lot for coming. We appreciate it. Come again. So the friends back at this place. I'd like to thank the speaker. This is an excellent. Uh, this is an excellent talk. Um, it was very informative. Um, it's wonderful to hear from a police officer um, who had uh, been on the force for several years. Um, there's one area that I think that we do need to be skeptical about, and that is is drug addiction and a disease. Um, Reason TV has, um, which is on YouTube, has occasionally uh, put up a couple clips featuring a neurologist from. Columbia University, and he researches drug addiction. Um, he's an African-American man who grew up in a, mm -hmm. a very poor neighborhood, uh, and he looked at some prior results and challenged them. One thing he found, um, there's a rat or a mouse, um, and the mouse continues to pull the lever um, and eventually overdoses on a drug. Um, <coughs> Then what he did is he set up that same circumstance, but he also put other uh, diversions, put a, a, a mouse of the opposite sex, yeah, put a running wheel, gave the mouse other things to do, not just be in a cage where the only source of stimulation was the, the, the drug. And not all the mice um, went into, uh, not all the mice overdosed. Um, some didn't become addicted. Uh, as with human beings, um, many people try heroin, some become addicts, some do not. Many people try cocaine, some become addicted, some do not. Some people can take heroin once a month, and that's it. Um, I think that addiction may be something that we may need to study more. Um, I also believe, and I have no evidence of this, but we have these residential rehab programs with high relapse rates. Well, when the drug addict um, or the purported drug addict is in rehab, he's away from his house, away from a lot of the stimuli, away from families and friends, and then when he gets out of the program, he returns to his family and friends, returns to this neighborhood, returns to the stimuli. Um, so, so you just may have an effect of him, you, you don't know whether he was really cured by treatment or whether it was just him being removed from his home surrounding. Um, do we have controlled studies um, with drug addiction where um, there was really a, a treatment that was more effective than someone, a control group, uh, on his own, just trying on his own to, to quit <coughs> drugs? And I think these questions need to be studied more. I think marijuana needs to be studied more, just stop making it a class one substance and, and we can study um, uh, what marijuana really is good for and what it isn't. But thank you. Why do you think they call it dope?
Hey. Yeah, just a drug problem, uh, heavy drugs. I don't consider marijuana a problem, um, much less than nicotine. But the drug problem is not going to be solved by criminalizing it. It's, it's, a, it's a much more complex problem. Um, the one factor that was not mentioned uh, much was moralizing the um, drug use. And um, that part has nothing to do with corrupt politicians, with the underworld, um, with uh, the prison industry. It has to do with the moral majority or the majority of people who believe Christians and probably um, the other monotheistic Abrahamic religions believe that this is sinful regardless of the consequences. Um, it's a type of morality that, that uh, personally bothers me because it's an impairment for progress. It's a type of morality that does not look at the consequence to human suffering and to the cost for humanity, rather as to what is, what they guess is something that God likes or doesn't. Um, and, and that factor, I think, is holding a lot of people for voting for those politicians who are motivated, of course, by the, the, the profit and the uh, popular opinion. So I don't know how to change that education, I guess. So um, that's... Uh, <laughs> I think that's the most complex uh, factor, is how to change the culture of morality. Um, they, just as far as the guns, um, I wish there were some, some, some statistics to show that really is a, a, that, that ownership of guns, the way it is now, with the objection even to background checks, is really a deterrent. Um, I wonder how much it is a deterrent versus the kind of Zimmerman uh, issue that if I think that the other guy has a gun, I better shoot first. Yeah. Get him. Shoot him. Yeah, shoot that son of a bitch. It's tough to either follow or be followed by Pat Butler, but somebody has to do it. Shoot him. All right. I enjoyed the presentation tonight. I am very, very sympathetic to LEAP uh, and what they stand for. I've heard uh, speakers from LEAP before here and at other uh, events and, and have always found them to be very informative. Uh, certainly, it seems just very commonsensical that we should legalize these issues. It, it will save money, it will bring uh, money into the coffers of various governments that need it, and uh, it will bring some level of reasonable control and, and quality control and so forth, so we won't have uh, as many tragedies as we have now. Uh, probably it would increase usage, uh, because during Prohibition even, uh, alcohol usage was cut in half and then doubled again after it was over, but nonetheless, uh, whether abuse was uh, uh, increased that much, we don't know. And, and it gives, give, people have a choice, you know, people have to make a choice to be responsible for themselves. The one thing which, uh, which I've heard emphasized before, uh, more so than tonight, is uh, and what I think the big problem is in ever getting this to pass, to become law, is the fact that there are so many vested interests with huge, huge huh. dollar amounts involved, uh, not just the illegal drug cartels and so forth, but the prisons, uh, the, the various enforcement agencies that spend some time, some spend less on it, as our speaker indicated, but uh, there's, there's a lot of effort that goes into this, 
And I've heard the figure, and I have no idea whether it's valid or not, that there are a million jobs in the United States which depend all or in part on the drug war. And if the drug war goes away, some of those jobs would go away. Well, you can, you can bet that you're not going to get a lot of political support from the people and organizations uh, that are uh, that have those jobs and, and get that revenue uh, from government and other sources, uh, just thousands of jobs. And politicians, uh, most politicians, there's a few good ones, but most politicians don't take pride in smaller budgets. They don't like smaller budgets. They like big, bigger budgets, more power, more people, etc. So something that's going to save them money is not necessarily something that they look at positively. But I think if we just uh, we hang in there, we keep talking about this over time, eventually, uh, just like the prohibition of alcohol, eventually uh, uh, this will become law. It's slowly happening in various, uh, various states. Uh, the other topic which has, has come up tonight is concealed, concealed carry. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to hear uh, that I, I'm not that familiar with police officers' opinion on concealed carry. I know uh, uh, a lot of other people's opinions, and I'm happy to hear that that is the viewpoint, because the, the whole benefit of concealed carry is not the fact that you have a gun, so that if a robber comes up and sticks a gun in your back, you're going to pull out your gun and shoot him. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the advantage of concealed carry is that the, uh, uh, the potential criminal doesn't know who has a gun, whether you have a gun or the guy coming down the street the other way or the person standing on the corner, they don't know. And, and this deters crime. With regard to statistics, Ayala, there were some studies done which still today I think are the definitive studies, uh, although there's a lot of argument about them, of course, from, from the uh, gun control people. The John Lott studies from some, some time ago. John Lott did a study of all 4,000 and some counties in the United States and he determined that uh, uh, crime went down shortly after uh, concealed carry was implemented. We have lots of anecdotal evidence about that in this place and that place uh, as well, uh, in addition to what our speaker told us about tonight. Uh, John Lott uh, found that the, the uh, crime went down 13 to 15 percent, and he estimated that there'd be 1,500 less murders in the United States, and he listed some other crimes as well, if we had concealed carry uh, all across the country. What concerned me is 13 to 15 percent didn't seem like a lot, and I finally figured out why the number is that low. Uh, he did all 4,000 counties in the United States. Uh, some of those counties never have crime, okay? Probably never had a murder, or very, very few. So if you have very, very little crime, it isn't going to go down much. In urban areas, the estimates are more like 30% and up will be reduced. Now, the argument against concealed carry is that weapons in a home are much more likely to be used against a member of that household than they are against an intruder. That is, uh, that is true, but that's a different law. That's the privilege of keeping a gun in your house uh, for self-defense, which we have had in Illinois now for a couple years. Again, Illinois was one of the last states uh, to bring that up. Concealed carry, of course, the concealed weapon will be kept in the home when the when the person is at home, but it is really it's uh, it's a slightly different issue. Now, our concealed carry law here in Illinois, while we finally have it and they're in the process of implementing it. Uh, is so riddled with res restrictions, it will, as the other laws uh, have been, will be challenged again, and eventually we'll get uh, uh, we'll get a sensible law, but it will take some time. Thank you. Yeah, we have we're all for sensible gun laws. It makes a lot of sense to give my loony. Let's face it, <coughs> our prisons. Are bursting at the seams. In some states loony. and in some counties, <laughs> there's practically a waiting list to get into jail. Uh, there are cases of where judges have delayed people's uh, the beginning of the time that they serve their sentences. It was usually 30, 60, 90 days, whatever, misdemeanors, until there is room. <coughs> we we heard tonight, and we've all heard it before that it is cheaper to send a person to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale 
than it is to keep someone in the county jail. Uh, both uh, President uh, Preckwinkle of the county board and uh, John Fritchie, uh, he's a member of the county board, former state representative, um, Commissioner Fritchie, who I believe has spoken at the College of Complexes yeah. in the past, uh, both of them have pointed out that it costs much more to lock a guy up uh, for a misdemeanor for a prolonged period of time, especially if he or she cannot make bail, uh, than, it, than it does to simply send a person to Yale or Harvard. Now, had I known that when I was about 18 or 19 and going to college, I would have offered the authorities a deal. <laughs> I will not commit a felony for the next four years, I promise. <laughs> or you can withhold the tuition that I would ask that you pay so that I can go to Harvard or to actually Trinity College in Dublin. I had applied and was accepted over there. It's expensive for foreigners to go there. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I would have been a good, solid citizen for at least four years. It would have been cheaper to do that than run the risk that I might run amok on the streets of Chicago and commit God knows what kind of crimes. But seriously, we like to think in places like this, uh, the College of Complexes, it's a fairly progressive organization. We like to think we're concerned about the needs of the truly deserving. Uh, we've all been taught to look for the needs of the truly deserving and take care of them first. And yet, the truly deserving are in many cases locked out of literally, the places that were designed to meet their needs, or more likely society's needs. I'm saying that for every drug criminal that you lock up, usually for possession, usually for, for, for possession of something like marijuana, the people that really need to be locked up, I'm talking about child molesters, I'm talking about the people that enable sure? them to Thank escape you. the law. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about six foot two thugs who kill with one punch a five foot one individual on Rust Street and almost gets away with it. I'm talking about guys like that who truly deserve the access to our state's penal facilities. They truly deserve it. Not some poor guy who's, you know, got uh, a few joints in his pocket, and there was a time when you could get locked up and do serious time for that. Some of them are probably still in some of these institutions. I'm saying that we as compassionate individuals should begin insisting that room be found in our prisons not for the minor drug offenders, but for the people who most richly deserve all that the state has to offer. I think this is something that any thinking American would realize, what about, good Lord, you need look no further than the city council or Congress or the state legislature to find people who would benefit uh, from such services from the state. <laughs> Let's put these scarce resources where they will do the most good. Let's look after the people who have been neglected. Let's not act like uh, the you know Dickinsonian society of 19th century England where the truly deserving were ignored. Let's seek out the truly deserving, lock them up. <laughs> Uh, and let's yeah. deal with this drug problem uh, in a more rational fashion than we have in the past. Fortunately, we have the example of prohibition. In the 1920s, as half a dozen people have pointed out, we engaged in what was called the quote-unquote noble experiment, where we were going to end wife-beating, we were going to end all kinds of other evils forever, simply by outlawing demon rum. <coughs> Folks, it didn't work. They were serving hooch in the White House during the height of Prohibition. 
The President of the United States himself was pouring for his friends. That was Warren G. Hardy. Uh, you know, so... <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, so so let's, let's, let's be realistic. We don't have the resources we had in the 1960s and early 1970s. Those resources have got to be utilized more sparingly. I suggest that there are any number of high-profiled individuals uh, who might, might benefit from these services. It would be good for them, it would certainly be good for us, and it would certainly be good for the country as a whole so that we can develop a more rational policy. I'm not suggesting that we throw all the laws out so that we have a state of complete anarchy. I am suggesting, however, that we go after the real criminals in our society, and they are not to be found uh, hanging around trying to uh, buy a few uh, joints. Uh, oh, I've just been uh, warned that uh, my time is running out. We're actually about a minute and a half over. I'm a minute and a half over. God knows what will happen to me if I speak much longer. Thank you. <laughs> a good idea. No loss and no one goes to jail. You know? All right, <laughs> <laughs> like the old man was. No laws and no one goes to jail. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Andy Anderson. For those of you that may not know me, if there's any unfamiliar people uh, watching this videotape when it gets posted, but uh, I have a, a couple of comments. In 1980, uh, John Goffman wrote an article called The Law Versus Justice. He was talking about the concept of <laughs> arresting people that were protesting nuclear power plants that could give us what we now know as a Fukushima and eliminate a state or half a country. There's a, we have a whole generation of people coming out of law schools that don't know anything about Nuremberg. The concept of uh, politicians passing laws making something legal, as long as it's legal, we can do it. Um, in this country, uh, Nancy Turner Banks wrote a book called AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. And a large part of that book talks about the last 150 years of corporations and our CIA and government officials involved in running drugs. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been involved in the drug trade. Over in, there's, it's highly profitable for politicians. The corruption goes right to the top. Another comment I would like to make is that politicians don't really lead. Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. Politicians follow. When an idea is, you know, right now a lot of more politicians are talking about legalizing marijuana because an overwhelming majority of the public is on that side now. They're for it. It's an idea whose time has come. The Catholic Church is finally uh, recognizing that they have to re <coughs> recognize and do something about the pedophile priest problem because they're losing money at the collection plate. The public reached critical mass and said enough is enough. Thirty years ago you could get into a fist fight in almost any restaurant in Chicago. You could get into a fist fight if you asked somebody to put out a cigarette uh, smoking next to your table. I got a God-given right to light up and puff away anywhere. You can't tell me uh, not to pollute your air. But look how, how far we've come in less than half a lifetime. You know. In less than a whole lifetime, uh, we've uh, people in the 60s reached critical mass and said, it's not okay to lynch black people anymore. We have to do something about this. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. You know, things get better when the public reaches critical mass. And I think uh, the idea of legalizing or decriminalizing drugs like they've done in uh, the Netherlands and the countries over there, uh, is an idea whose time has come. But in America, politicians don't talk about it because American politicians are part and parcel of one of the greatest welfare for billionaire programs that Earth has ever seen. Our, the job of the average politician, especially Republicans, is to shovel money to the billionaires. And also, the, the, I'm reading a book called Critical Condition. I'll, I'll be giving a talk on this in a, in a few months. A summary of a few new books uh, that, that talk about where we are with health care in America. Uh, our health care system is designed, there's a whole uh, army of bureaucrats whose job it is
to deny claims and let people die so that they don't have to pay for their health care. That's their job, is to deny claims. And if you, you did that in any other modern country on earth, the police just come out and arrest you. The way we treat people in America on a variety of things is just flat out illegal in other countries, other modern civilized countries. America is number one. We rank number one in the world by a wide margin of having the most unequal modern society in history between the billionaires at the top and the people at the bottom. Young people, especially inner city young people in Chicago, are when they graduate, if they're lucky enough to graduate from high school, they're faced with a stark choice. Either start, start selling drugs to try to support yourself or go into the military. The jobs that they could have been doing, that they were doing in factories and everything else, those assembly lines with all the hundreds of tons of machinery that manufactures things, they were disassembled here and reassembled in China. The, the jobs physically are not in America anymore. It's a, it's a tremendous obscenity, an intellectual obscenity to tell a young person, get motivated and go out and get a job, when physically the jobs just flat aren't here. <clears throat> Several studies have shown that when uh, a, a new corporation, a new company opens a manufacturing facility, maybe there's 300 jobs that pay uh, as much as $15 an hour. They said, <clears throat> with all the people that sign up, resumes, 30,000, you, you have a better chance of getting into Harvard than you do landing one of those $15 an hour jobs in America. So, you know, uh, it's, the American, I'll, I'll close here quickly. Got another minute. The middle class has been under attack since Ronald Reagan was installed in the White House. The middle class in America is being flat out eliminated, totally eliminated by corporate, the military, educational, media, industrial complex. And solving those problems starts with all of us reaching critical mass and facing reality and speaking out on these things. It starts from the bottom up. Just like it's an idea whose time has come that we have small free restaurants. So uh, thank you for your time, and we will see you again in a few weeks.
uh, went to the Gentiles and ate their kind of food that might be sacrificed to all sorts of pagan gods and you didn't know what and you were going straight to hell and uh, so uh, people were afraid of being condemned as unclean themselves uh, by what they ate or what they didn't eat or how they washed their uh, pots and pans or whatever. And uh, Jesus said that was not the uh, true emphasis of, of religion. Well, he did also say that not a jot or tittle would pass from the law till all was fulfilled. There was some reason behind each of all those prohibitions. Okay? And I think when we run up against uh, uh, people uh, uh, who are uh, religiously committed uh, to uh, uh, not going in a bar or whatever, uh, uh, or who are looking down their nose at someone uh, who is uh, taking uh, drugs, however unhealthy those drugs may be, the point is to pray for people and not to condemn them. Mm -hmm. I pray for all of you. First of all, Brown, I'm glad to see that how well you know the history of the Jews. Um, it's been perhaps been suggested by Woody Allen, among others, that perhaps what the Torah really prohibited was the eating of pork in certain restaurants. Um, I do take issue with one comment that was made here earlier that it's all oh, it's the religious people who were responsible for moralizing against drugs. Wrong is the fundamentalists among the religious people. I'm not a fundamentalist. I go to synagogue uh, every weekend or almost every weekend. And I agree with uh, Mr. Ryan's statements here about, about the legalization of drugs. I think you did an excellent job. You're one of the best speakers we've had here, and I've been coming here for over 10 years. Um, I do take issue with your comments, however, about, about concealed carry. Since I'm not interested in taking guns away from hunters, provided they obey the game laws and certain rules that would be dictated by common sense, which most of them would follow anyway. Uh, but once you get beyond that, I'm sorry, I don't think anyone other than police and military people need access to firearms. Uh, otherwise, you're going to continue to have more incidents like Sandy Hook, where that kid got into his mother's weapons. Uh, even so, I'm not in favor of concealed carry or private ownership of guns except with permits and except for people who hunt. Um, with regard to prohibition, now I spent much of my teenage years growing up in Evanston, Illinois, which as we all know is the headquarters of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. <laughs> and which I moved, when I moved to Evanston in 1969 when I was 15, well, uh, you couldn't, there were no packaged goods stores. I believe there's still not any in Evanston. No, there are. And there are now. There are now, okay. And there certainly 
was no place where you could get a drink there if you wanted one. Uh, then we had, <laughs> yes, there are. Now not there are. Not at the time. Not, not, not at the not time. Oh, that changed in the 70s when a Holiday Inn came in, and they said, guess what? We're not going to build this Holiday Inn unless you give us a liquor license. And that started much breast being among the Women's Christians Temperance Union. Uh, but in the end, the city council passed the ordinance, and much to the consternation of the WCTU, the liquor license for uh, liquor with, for drinks with the meal was served, or was uh, passed. Um, most of us need no description of what mob cars look like, since at least some of us watch the untouchables and reruns on our local television <coughs> station. Um, and most of us, when we, or many of us, when we hear that federal agents have raided anywhere, regardless of what agency they happen to work for, well, there are at least some of us who say to themselves, well, did one of them at least look or sound like Robert Stack? As in, um, federal officers, Travis, open up. Now, with regard to um, the, the suggestions that you made for the legalization of drugs, I'm in favor of it. If for no other reason, then that will give the federal government the power and the states the power to tax and regulate drugs. And that way, as you said, we, they can regulate what goes into this stuff and we will have fewer incidents like what happened to Philip Seymour. <coughs> um, somebody else, I think it was Mr. Butler, who mentioned that among the deserving people is the six-foot thug who punched young David Kalishman in the bar. We wouldn't be talking about a young man would be who was a certain nephew of a certain former mayor. I would. Yes, I, I would think so. And um, his punishment uh, happily awaits. He's certainly one of the deserving people who would benefit from the police having more time provided that they actually take the time, which appears to have been in some doubt in this case, whether they actually took the time. Finally, I think they have no doubt that you were an effective police officer when you worked for the city of Denver. I thank you for your service to the public, and because of your obvious intelligence and because of your appearance, I have no doubt when you were out on the street that you had no trouble making the power of your office fully felt out there. Thank you. By the way, uh, I think it was uh, um, a rabbi I used to take a class with him whose name I can't remember when I should. Uh, who said that the first institution of any uh, Jewish community in the United States is a good Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Especially on Christmas Day. <laughs> yeah. Speaker gets the, oh, speaker gets the last word. Thank you. Yes. Speaker gets the last word. Yes. Mr. Ryan, uh, Please uh, bring these forms up to me. We'd like to have those so we can see what we can improve. Thank you all for your comments. Uh, quite interesting. Thank you. And there was no one that I disagreed with, to tell you the truth. But I'm kind of a radical sometimes myself. Uh, I have some rather uh, tough attitudes about some things. I'm kind of a, I don't really like, for lack of a better term, I don't like Mickey Mouse attitudes or activities that tend to mess with society. I think. Uh, the government and some of the laws they pass do that quite well enough. We don't need to add to that. So there are a lot of things that we can change, including some of the laws that law enforcement has to enforce. The ones that we addressed tonight were at the top of my list. They always have been because, first of all, it's fruitless. Secondly, it's very expensive. And third, it doesn't solve a thing. That's all in a nutshell. But uh, I kind of like this. I wish I lived here so I could come and debate whatever with you guys. <laughs> you know, I used to do debate in high school and college, you know, and sometimes I went to debate once in high school and a guy said, you're the best debater, but you know, could you treat the other guy a little more nicely? <laughs> sometimes I can get on a high horse too, but, but thank you very much and uh, for your comments and for your attention in the first place. All right, thank you. Pleasure.